Good morning, everybody. Good morning. It's good to see you all and welcome you to Draminis. If you're visiting with us this morning, it's super to have you here. If you're back after a while away, equally so great to see you this morning. It's also lovely to welcome David Whitmarsh. Um, he's going to be talking to us later on. Um, this will give it away. Um, you'll know who David is when you see the compassion um, literature and banners. And there's a table out in the vestibule that you can look at as well um, for a minute or two afterwards. David, it's great to have you back. You're very, very welcome at Draminis. Before I forget, can I say a thank you to all who help with Trilogy? Um, Willie and team did a great job on Monday and Tuesday night with our secondary school age young folks. Um, another super couple of nights. Um, and thank you to everybody help, who helped with that. If you get the, the WhatsApp, the announcement WhatsApp, you'll have noticed um, summer arrangements of who's on when, who's preaching when, who's covering. Um, I'll put a paper copy of that out next Sunday in the vestibule as well. Um, but again, as I've mentioned before, if you want your name added to the, the WhatsApp group so that you get the announcements sent that way, um, speak to me or get a friend to pass on your mobile number and we can add you to that announcement group. Remember that next week, being the first Sunday in July, we go to the earlier time of 10 and then Red Rock at 11.15. So our morning services in the summer are a wee bit shorter. Um, Draminis at 10, and then Red Rock at 11.15. Just on that topic of the, the two churches, this, actually probably even around this particular Sunday, marks the occasion that Draminis and Red Rock as an idea became a reality. Um, we've been joined for about 100 years, and we're going to mark that officially in September. And um, I think we are one of the oldest unions of two Presbyterian churches um, on the island. And so at the beginning of September, we're, among other things that we're going to do, we're going to have the 1st and the 8th of September where we meet together as one church family. So the 1st of September will be up at Red Rock and the 8th of September will be here. And um, we'll go to them a Sunday they'll come to us a Sunday before we get into the, the normal routine uh, of our winter activities with Sunday school and everything else. So that's one thing to keep in mind, and there'll be one or two other special markers of that 100 years, um, and we want to thank God for that union that we've had with Red Rock and mark it in a special way. There are a couple of boxes in the vestibule that I want to mention. One is for sensory toys to go with Lucy to Uganda. Um, if you want to look at the box, you'll get an idea of what's in that box. And next Sunday still wouldn't be too late to, to leave one or two things there. And then also we've mentioned um, Myanmar and the, the BST, the Biblical School of Theology, and the Elpis School in Yangon, where I was um, in the autumn. Any books of any type, reading books, any sort of books that you might give to a sort of 4- to 14-year-old, those are going to be transported later on in the month to Myanmar um, so if you want to leave anything off in the next week do that and then we'll get those sent off with James Farmer those are all the announcements that I want to make this morning um, James is going to lead us um, in worship this morning um, I'll be back up in a wee minute or two and David will be up as well but James thank you for leading us in worship this morning It's good to be with you all this morning. Uh, we're here to, to worship God. And as we worship God, read uh, these verses from 1 Peter, chapter 2, verse 9. You're a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. I stand to sing, Lord, your church on earth is seeking.
uh, let's, let's come before our Lord in prayer. Let's pray. Our great God and Heavenly Father, you are light, and in you there is no darkness at all. Your light is an everlasting light, which needs no power source. It will not dim, it cannot flicker, but from everlasting to everlasting, you give light, for in you there is no shadow of change. Almighty God, there is no limit to your power, no one can measure the abundance of your perfections, yet you communicate them to us. Your word, O oh God, is a lamp for our feet and a light on our path. With you is the fountain of life. In your light, we see light. Lord God, there is no one like you. You are holy and you are good. Your greatness is unsearchable. Indeed, you dwell in unapproachable light. And so before you we bow, in humility we adore you, you are perfect. Yet we confess that we have not sought you, we have attempted to ignore your penetrating light, we have seen things which communicate to us your glory and your goodness, we have been beneficiaries of your grace, yet we have not acknowledged you or thanked you. We have cut the gifts from the giver. We have separated the benefits from the source of all good. We often take for granted your grace, O oh God. We often take for granted your word. Even though it is a lamp for our feet, we often leave it in the darkest corner of the room. We confess that we often shut our eyes from you to ease our conscience because we feel more comfortable in the darkness than in the light. We have found refuge in our old habits that once gave us pleasure. We made our home in the sins we used to commit before we knew you. We have been drawn into darkness time and time again. Yet Lord Jesus, you are the light of the world. In you was life, and the life was the light of all mankind. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Lord Jesus, we look to you for mercy. For you give freely out of the abundance of your perfections. Your forgiveness stretches further and is more powerful than our sin. Your mercy is more Lord Jesus, you called us out of darkness by your spirit into your wonderful night, wonderful light. You have called us a chosen people, a, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that we may declare your praises, that we might as royal priests bring the good news of the gospel to all people, that we as your church might be a light that shines before others, a city built on a hill. Lord God, we worship you this morning. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Our reading this morning is found from Mark 10, uh, Mark 10, uh, 46 to 52. It's Mark 10, 46 to 52. It's on page... 1014 in the Pew Bibles. Or 1015. This is God's Word. Then they came to Jericho as Jesus and his disciples, together with a large crowd, were leaving the city. A blind man, Bartimaeus, that is, the son of Timaeus, was sitting by the roadside begging. When he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to shout, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Many rebuked him and told him to be quiet, but he shouted all the more, son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus stopped and said, call him. So they called to the blind man, cheer up, on your feet, he's calling you. Throwing his cloak aside, he jumped to his feet and came to Jesus. 
What do you want me to do for you? Jesus asked him. The blind man said, Rabbi, I want to see. Go. And Jesus said, Jesus, your faith has healed you. Immediately, he received his sight and followed Jesus along the road. We're going to sing once more uh, our hymn, What a Wonderful Saviour. Please stand as we'll sing. Sam and uh, Lucy and Hannah to come up and we'll have our uh, have an interview. Oh, yes. Sorry, don't know where it is. <laughs> Brilliant. Girls, come on round into the middle. Um, Phil, are we on here? Brilliant. So, girls, at the various stages that you're talking, I'll get you to step forward and talk into this and then everybody will hear you. Um, so sp speak to them and don't worry about me, is the general rule. Lucy and Hannah, great to have you back. Um, I've said in both churches, one of my joys and excitements is to see not just the, the row of children that we have through the winter, Sunday by Sunday with us at Sunday school and in worship, but it's even more exciting to me to see young adults, teenagers progressing through, but still coming back, still following Jesus and wanting to serve him. So girls, that's my biggest excitement, um, having you in church for that reason, never mind what you're doing this summer. But what are you doing this summer? Lucy, I'm going to let you go first. Where are you going? When are you going? And who are you going with? So okay. fire away. So on the 14th of July, I'm heading to Uganda. I'm going back to the same place where I was last year, Nakasangola. So it's about four or five hours north of the capital, Kampala. I'm going there with it's two girls from Kilkale who have set up a charity called Hopeful Horizons and they go out to work with children who have special needs. So we'll be going out there in July just to work with them, going around the community and try and helping them as best we can. Brilliant. And you're, you're currently studying nursing, so you've got a... Yeah, yeah, at least I have some sort of background even to help them. I'm with Katie as well. She, so yeah, you, she you have all the practice in the world. Yeah. <laughs> Brilliant. Um, so just to keep it in my memory, four hours north of Kampala... Yeah. 14th of July, 14th of July for, two, yeah. for two weeks? Two weeks, yeah. Brilliant. Okay, Hannah, um, we'll do the same Hi. with you. So where are you going, when are you going, and who are you going with? Perfect. Um, I'm also going to an African country, but I'm going to Kenya, um, not Uganda. And I'm actually going on Friday coming, um, which is the 5th, but we land on Saturday the 6th, so I'm kind of travelling throughout that day. Um, and I'm there for two weeks in a place called Kikuyu, which is just outside Nairobi, um, about 20 minutes. Um, 
and I'm going with a team from an organization called Mission Africa, which I'm sure some people have heard of. Um, and there's four people in our team, so myself and three other ladies. And um, yeah, we're going to volunteer primarily at a rescue center for vulnerable women, um, which is sort of aided through a local church um, and doing bits and pieces in a home for the aged and in a girls' school as well. So sort of a bit, bit of a mix um, of things to do with women and women's leadership through the church. Brilliant. Just when I have you on that, the, the team of four ladies, two yeah. older, two Well, younger. two ladies in their 50s. Oh, thanks. <laughs> older. <laughs> older. older. Um, Age of your daddy. Yeah, and then myself and then another girl who is a student at Stramillis. So we're kind of the two students. Crazy the way the world works. We turned up at Hannah's commissioning service and I recognised a, a couple. I thought, where have I, where have I seen you guys before? And the guy, as I have changed in 30 odd years, so this fella had changed. I realised I'd played in the same under 15s medallion rugby team at Ballymena Academy in 19 something. And his daughter yeah. is the, the other girl that's going, the other yeah. Sarah. Yeah. So, brilliant. I'll bring Lucy back a wee minute. Hannah sort of veered into the what you'll be doing. Lucy, tell us a wee bit about yeah. what you're going to be doing um, when you're away. Okay. So the charity was set up by two girls from Kilkeel and one of which is a learned disability nurse. But they are already out in Uganda. So on the 14th, I'm heading out with their cousin who is a special needs teacher. So when we go out there, we'll be going around the community and then trying to get physio even for the children so that they're able to go to school and source wheelchairs for them because some of them don't actually have wheelchairs and they're just crawling around the floor, which means if they get wheelchairs, they could actually go to school. Um, as well as that, some of them don't actually know what their child has, so it's providing them knowledge about the certain diagnoses that they might have and sort of ways that they can help their child lead as normal life as possible because they don't have the services that we have over here. So it's trying to provide them with some sort of knowledge again about their disease. What are you, just yeah. keep going with you, Lucy, for a wee minute. Yeah. What are you looking forward to or anxious about as you, yeah. you head away? Well, I think what I'm anxious about is obviously having Katie. It'll be emotional. Mm -hmm. um. You'll be grand. <laughs> You'll be grand. <laughs> um. yeah. And Katie will be grand till you get back. <laughs> well, I don't know. <laughs> um, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Your mum and dad might be glad well. to see you come back. <laughs> um. But yeah, no, I'm looking forward to actually going out there as well. It'll be oh Hannah, you go. That's the way to play it, Lucy. <laughs> Hannah, yes, tell us. I mean, Hannah, from your point of view, okay. because I know from bits of conversation, what you're looking forward to. What are you a bit apprehensive and anxious about in, in your writing? Yeah, um, I think obviously because I've been away at uni and then um, I'm coming back, I have only really met the team once, um, and they've all been meeting up sort of a couple of times every month. Um, I've been joining on Zoom, which has been lovely, um, but I've only met the girls once, so that'll be kind of a big thing, us all sort of getting to know each other at the airport um, and on our flight. Um, and I guess I'd also, I would really appreciate prayer there with that, that our team would be able to really gel together and be united, um, especially whenever the stuff we're doing, I think will be emotionally intense in a different sort of way. Um, a lot of the stuff we're doing with kind of vulnerable women who have been taken out of abusive situations, um, there's still a lot going on by way of um, FGM and things like that in that part of Kenya. And youth um, marriage. Yeah, and girls, and I think um, Sarah and I were chatting about it, and I think that'll be one thing that we'll find particularly hard, is that a lot of the girls that we're chatting to, getting to know, will be our age, but living <sighs> totally different lives and won't have had the same opportunities that we had, that we're both... Um, at uni and studying, um, and I think I'll find that really hard. Girls similar age to me, but who have been through so much, um, and just, yeah, I think I'll find that quite emotionally intense. Um, so I'm a wee bit apprehensive about that. But that's something to, for us to pray about yeah, while you're away. Yeah. Yeah. Lucy, we can yeah, bring, bring, <laughs> bring you back for, for things to pray about. You know, that would yeah. be great. Okay, so I am excited about going out there and seeing everybody again that I've left behind. Um, and I'm also excited to actually help the children because we have so many services over here that we're grateful for. They don't have that over there, so it'll be nice to go over there and try and help them. Um, when we're over there, oh, and as well as that, we're going to hand out these little leaflets here. Some of these are in Lugandan as well, so they can, it's easily translated for them. 
Um, something to pray about when we're over there is obviously our safety, travelling, and then out in the community as well. Like it, it can be dangerous, and they sort of when you see four white girls coming along, we're obviously going to stand, stand out. out. <laughs> yeah. Um, so pray for our safety in the community, and then also pray for the health of the children because it can deteriorate so quickly. It's not just as easy for them as going to the hospital. You know, if their child takes sick, they have to work for that money to take their child to the hospital, which means that the child's health deteriorates even more quickly. And then pray that we'd have an opportunity as well to give out these leaflets. Super. Girls, thank you so much. Um, just that, that reminder, Hannah leaves this Friday for a fortnight. Lucy then goes a week after that yeah. for a fortnight. Um, girls, I'm going to say thank you. And I mean, it, there'll be opportunity for folks to get a, a hello as well um, and to encourage you and pray for you over the next few weeks. And as you head back down round to your seats, I'm going to pray for you, but I want to add a couple of things. So I'll let you guys duke round. Um, and I want to mention as well, as Lucy mentioned the wheelchairs, um, and, and that's a situation that Nathan and Beth are going out to Mozambique. Um, from Red Rock at the end or in the middle of July and that's one of the things there'll be a delivery of wheelchairs and they're going to be involved in that. At the moment Reuben and Lindsay and children are in Senegal. They flew on Friday. They're there for a fortnight with Rab and Kyla Cuthbert um, and ambassadors. Pray particularly um, Reuben and Lindsay's case didn't arrive the kids' stuff did arrive, but Reuben and Lindsay's clothes, some of their medicines and sun cream um, didn't arrive. And that's particularly challenging because it's not the same as going on your summer holidays and nipping in and buying shorts and t-shirts for a week. Um, you, you've got to dress appropriately in a Muslim country. Um, so having got all that organized, the case hasn't turned up. Let's pray that it might yet still arrive with them with Rab and Kyla in the next day or two, and if not, that they can manage without it. It's a secondary thing, but it's still um, significant. So we're going to pray for Reuben and Lindsay and the children. We're going to pray that Katie, sorry, Hannah goes, then Katie goes, um, and we want to, sorry, Lucy, I'm sorry. <laughs> it took a look this way of, of horror. No, it's not Katie that's going, it's Lucy that's going. I'm sorry, Lucy. Um, we'll pray for the girls and, and ask the Lord's help on what they're doing um, over the next few weeks. Let's pray together. Father, I thank you this morning that this is good news not to be kept to ourselves. And forgive us when our vision of you has merely been the God who gives us things, who blesses us and our own, and our eyes never lift to see the world around us. And so to that end, Father, we thank you um, for Reuben and Lindsay and their children out in Senegal with Rab and Kyla. We pray for their safety. Father, we pray that if it's your will, that case would turn up um, that would make things a bit easier for them. We pray, Lord, um, even this evening as they go to the ambassador's um, presentation evening and prize night, that they would make friendships that would allow them to be useful to your kingdom as they work with some of the young people from that predominantly Muslim community over the next fortnight. Father, protect them and help them to shine for you. Lord, we pray for Lucy as she heads to Uganda in a couple of weeks' time. Father, thank you for the link that she already has, not only with that country, but the burden that you've placed on her heart for those with additional needs. Father, I ask and pray this morning that by your Holy Spirit, you would use the gifts and the compassionate heart that you've given Lucy as she works alongside these girls in challenging situations, equipping and helping. Lord, we pray that even in the time that she's there, she would see the difference that her going out can make. And Lord, we pray for your hand in all those situations as works of compassion are accompanied with this word of gospel truth. Lord, we pray that it would sink deep in hearts and lives. Father, we pray for Hannah as she heads to Kenya we thank you for all the privileges that our young people have here in education, in all the protections that surround them socially and culturally. We pray, Father, for these Kenyan young girls who have come through so much. And we pray that in the team that goes out, the four ladies, that you would use them to bring hope and encouragement and gospel foundation for the lives of these young people in Kenya. Father, thank you for 
the, the great legacy of Mission Africa and for the friendship that we had with Paul Bailey when he was with us. Lord, we pray that you would continue to cause us to be a people who lift our eyes to the needs of the world for the sake of the kingdom of Christ so that one day we might have real joy when every name, every tongue, every la language, every tribe is gathered before you. Lord, these things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. James, I'm going to hand back to you. We're going to uh, sing once more. Um, we're going to sing, There is an Everlasting Kindness. Love you here, uh, Lucy and Hannah. Their mission trip and soon to come. Um, we're going to hear uh, from David now. Uh, I'll welcome up David. Um, David's here representing Compassion UK, and we're very thankful to have you here, David. And boys and girls, 
so they get to escape. <laughs> It's great to be with you. My name is David Whitmarsh. Um, I grew up over those fields in a place called Rich Hill, and that's why I speak like this. This is my County Armagh accent. I've been 31 years in England, so you have to talk slower in England, and you have to pronounce some words differently. They couldn't tell the difference between a farmer and a fireman. <laughs> and uh, lots of other, like, with no idea what oxters are. Um, and for an inst, um, they have no idea what that meant. So there's some words we use that they don't understand, and there are other words that they use, uh, like grockle. I bet you've never heard of a grockle before. They're the tourists who come and block the roads. I, I, my first church was Cheddar in Somerset, and uh, the tourists come on a Saturday. It's an absolute disaster. You don't go near the main road on a Saturday because the tourists, they're bumper to bumper, and it's about two miles an hour on the main road. So uh, they're called grockles, but that's maybe a new word for some of you. However, I'm here to talk about compassion, and thank you for what you're doing uh, for those living in extreme poverty. Thank you, what you're doing is amazing. Um, I don't have a clicker, so I'm, we're going to do a thumbs up if that's okay. Lads, thank you. This is, this is the compassion difference. Uh, we work among those living in extreme poverty. Uh, the UN define extreme poverty as living on less than $2.15 a day. That's about one pound 80, so it's not very much. Um, people say to me, but aren't there people poor in Northern Ireland? Yes, there are. Um, I usually say not many of them die of starvation. I actually asked the chief executive of NSPCC, how many children in the UK, this is the whole of the UK, die each week of starvation? And the answer is one, okay? Now compare that, so that's 52 a year, roughly 50 or so a year die in the UK of starvation, that's children. The comparative figure for the developing world is five million, five million. So there's 50 children that die of starvation in the UK every year and there's five million children die in the developing world each year. That number is coming down, but it gives you a sort of perspective on it as well. Um, compassion works in the slums, works in the poor areas, and our work is Christ-centered. Now, um, don't get me wrong, teachers are essential because we believe in education. Healthcare is essential because we believe in being healthy, and that's important. Um, safeguarding uh, is important, and we do that. Um, but the most important thing of all is Christ. Jesus changes lives. And when, as a pastor, you get to the end of it all and you're conducting a funeral, the most important question of all is, <coughs> did they know Jesus as their savior? Did they live for him? And is their eternity secure in the Lord Jesus? And that's why we always share the gospel. That's why every child hears the gospel every week. And we know the gospel changes lives. The second thing, and it's a C as well, church driven. We believe that God has ordained the local church to be the carrier of the gospel. So we come alongside local churches, we work with them, and we enable them to reach the children in their area and make a difference for those children. One of the slums I, I visited in 2019 in Nairobi um, had a population of about half a million. I'm told that the population now is one million. And in that uh, slum, we had one church partner, and there, uh, they ministered to 300 children and their families. Um, but as you can guess, in 500,000, 500, half a million home, half a million people, 
300 children is just scratching the surface. But it was my joy to see uh, and hear the work that was going on there, uh, to understand how a, a Saturday works. We pray for, pay for them to go to school. It's a nominal fee, but if you have no money, you can't afford it. Uh, we pay for them to have a, a uniform, to have shoes, to be able to go to school. And on a Saturday, they come to the church project, and that runs from 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. And in the church, they hear about the Lord Jesus, they sing, um, they uh, do quizzes, they uh, do memory verses, and they have uh, a hot meal, and also um, have games. Uh, and when you're poor, um, there's not much fun, and uh, they give an opportunity for recreation as well as work. They learn um, skills, vocational skills. They go away being able to uh, weave and uh, make things, soap, um, do hairdressing, um, be involved in IT. Everybody wants to do IT nowadays. Um, but we, we teach them those sorts of things on a Saturday. And then we say, you're invited back to church on Sunday. And over 95% of the children do come back to church on a Sunday because that's where their friends are and that's where they love to be. So um, everything's church driven. The church tell us what they need in that community and we try to meet those needs. Every gift that you give, we guarantee that 80% of it goes to the church and the church are able to distribute that gift as they see need and, and they uh, believe is the right way to do it. Everything we do is child focused. We believe no child should live in poverty and we believe we can make a difference. So if we, at the beginning, find a, a lady whose pregnancy is at risk, we will come alongside that lady and make sure she has sufficient food and nutrition to eat uh, so that she is uh, well when the uh, baby is born. And then we'll make sure uh, postnatal that there's care. We'll take her right through to primary age, right through to secondary age, right through adolescence, and make sure they have a vocation or an employment or a degree and are able to earn a living, make a living for themselves. Unlike their parents and probably their grandparents who were day laborers. It's almost like biblical times where they turn up at the street corner, the edge of the slum, and they wait for farmers to turn up and say, I've got work for you today. And if the farmer has work, they, they go with the farmer. And if the farmer has no work, they don't get work, they don't get paid, and they don't eat. And that's how it generally works. The, the similarities to the biblical world that we read about in the Gospels is uncanny, that it's still like that today in our world. Thank you. These are the children that you're sponsoring, seven of them all together, and we're really grateful for your partnership. That makes a huge difference in their lives. You are changing their world, and you are releasing them from poverty in Jesus' name. Thank you so much. Your impact, um, this shows the hours that they're in the project, 2,254. They've had 900-ish uh, nutritious meals, 14 medical checks. We do a medical check um, once a year at least. Uh, so a doctor or a nurse will see them at the project. And if they have medical needs, um, if they develop uh, something that needs hospital treatment, Compassion will make sure that they get to the hospital. It could be... Uh, many miles away and we'll make sure the, ho the family are looked after and that they have sufficient funds uh, to pay for the hospital uh, because of your generosity and because of your sponsorship. And you'll see that although there are seven children, there are nine Bibles have been given. When they change from primary to secondary, when they move from uh, infants to primary, there, there'll be a new Bible given to them. So nine Bibles have been given to them which they adore and, and, and value and share with their families at home. So thank you for what you're doing. You are making a life-changing difference. Thank you. Letters. People feel guilty about letters. How many people love receiving letters? Oh gosh, I can tell you've received a lot of bills. <laughs> How many people love receiving a personal letter? 
be honest. We send our, uh, we have grandchildren. Uh, two grandchildren live in Cheltenham and two live in uh, upstate New York. And we send them, well, my wife sends them notes, I'll be honest with you. She sends them notes all the time. You know the sort of note you take to the shop and you get sweets with them? And so they usually send us a wee thank you letter because they've worked out if they send a thank you letter, they get more notes. <laughs> and uh, it's lovely to receive their letters and lovely to hear from them. And we, we just love receiving their letters. Now, you've received 27 letters uh, since I was here last, in the last 12 months. That's, that's phenomenal for, for those seven children. That's quite a few letters, that's almost four each. And you have written 13 back. Now, you might think that's bad, but actually it's not, it's good. And uh, the national average is 38% response. So you've got nearly 50% response rate. So that's really good. So I want you to give yourselves a, a pat on the back. That's really good. Now, what I'd like next time is that you, you do even better um, because it's just lovely. Even if, it's, if you've got a, a smartphone, you can download the app and you can write a birthday card or a Christmas card. And if you, even if it's only a sentence or two, I'm a man of few words, uh, you'll laugh at that, won't you? Um, but uh, just to say thank you, I love you, uh, you're special, you can do this, uh, God loves you. Here's, here's a verse we learned in church today, and it's really spoken to me. And sh share that with them, share what God's doing in your life, and ask them about their life and how it's going. And uh, do stay connected, do... Um, send a little note. We'll remind you about their birthday about 10 weeks in advance. That's because the whole process, uh, even though you do it digitally, it may take eight weeks before that's hand delivered to the child. So that's why we give 10 weeks notice. And that's why we give you plenty of warning to send a birthday note to the child. And uh, it's hand delivered. And even though you did it on your phone, it'll be a piece of paper or card and it'll be delivered to them. Uh, it could be translated then hand delivered so that's why we say eight weeks in advance it could take eight weeks but thank you thank you for writing back that's amazing please keep doing it thank you yeah that's amazing i want to think about bartimaeus i suppose to be politically correct today we'd say he was visually impaired other people might say he was differently enabled uh, my friends who are visually impaired have their other senses are much higher than mine so Bartimaeus could hear he could hear there was something happening and you and I reading through Mark's gospel can tell there's something happening because the whole point of Mark's gospel is to take us through the life of Jesus and here we see he's coming close to Calvary. Now, we've got the whole picture. We can see what's happening. And this is actually on the journey. He told the um, time of his death to the disciples in verse 32. He'd reminded them for the third time, Mark tells us. This is the third time that Jesus reminds them that he's going to die and that he's going to rise again. Now, they were a dull bunch and didn't get it. But that's the whole point of the journey. And here he is leaving Jericho with his disciples and a great crowd and the blind man Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus, just in case you get confused, was there. And he heard the commotion. He heard the noise. He knew there was something different happening. And he heard it was Jesus of Nazareth. And so he shouted out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And many rebuked him. Be quiet. There are many people that will put someone with a disability down. Do you know, in the developing world, if a child is born with a disability, they're often left to die. It breaks our heart. Because as Christians, we believe that every individual, whether differently enabled or not, we believe they're made in the image of God. We believe God loves them, God cares for them, and we believe that Jesus died for them. So that's a challenge. 
for Christians when they find out and find a baby that's been abandoned. I've heard of babies who've been abandoned on a rubbish tip. I've heard of babies that have been abandoned in banana fields. And thankfully for those two children, there's been a Christian who's come along, rescued the child, adopted the child, and fed the child and raised the child. And this man was very well used to people telling him to shut up. So do you think he stopped when they rebuked him, told him to be quiet? No, not at all. He cried out all the more, Mark says, inspired by the Holy Spirit. He said, son of David, have mercy on me. He knew who was passing by. He recognized him as the son of David. He knew he was someone different. And he cried out to him. And Jesus stopped. I find this remarkable. In our busy world, in our busy lives, we've all got places to be, things to do, people to see. And the temptation is that we remain focused and we've got that focus in mind, that place in mind, that person in mind, that job in mind, and we just forget about everyone along the way. But Jesus was moved with compassion, and he stopped for the one. There was a great crowd with him. He could have said, I'm okay, I've got the majority of the people here. I'm not going to worry about that man. He's, he's visually impaired. He's blind. He's not that important. I'll keep going. I'm going to Calvary. I'm going to Jerusalem. But Jesus stopped and said, call him. And they called the blind man and said, take heart, cheer up, get up. He's calling you and throwing off his cloak. You see, there's nothing wrong with him physically apart from his eyesight. He jumped up, sprang up and came to Jesus. His legs were fine. He jumped up. And Jesus said to him, what do you want me to do? I'd love to have been there to hear how Jesus says those words, because we don't get the intonation, do we, in the question when we read it. What do you want me to do? What do you want me to do? What do you want me to do? So there's different ways you can ask the question. But the blind man knew immediately what he was to say, because the thing that prevented him from working and making a living, the thing that prevented him from having dignity and choice the thing that was hindering him was his eyesight. If he had his eyesight, he could work, he could make a living, he could no longer beg, and he'd be released from poverty. And so he said, Rabbi, let me recover my sight. What an amazing thing. Jesus said to him, go your way. Your faith has made you well. Simple words. In other places, he used spittle and soil and all that sort of thing. But this, in this instance, on his way to the cross, before he got to Palm Sunday, coming into Jerusalem, he just said the words, go your way. Your faith has made you well. Jesus had compassion on him. Jesus spoke the words and the Bible tells us immediately he recovered his sight. It was a miracle. It was God at work and he followed him on the way. Do you think for one moment that Bartimaeus kept that to himself? He would have been jumping and he would have been excited and he would have been shouting and telling everyone he met that God had made a difference in his life, that he who he knew as Jesus, the Son of God, changed his life completely. And today I'm going to thank you for many of you who are making a difference in the lives of children living in poverty. You are raising their self-esteem. You are changing their hope you are making a difference 
in their feeling, their position, and their outlook. And you are changing their lives. Thank you. And I want to challenge you as well. Some of you are not yet sponsoring a child. And I want to say, a child is like a field where you plant, have an opportunity to plant seeds. An opportunity to sow the word of God, to make a difference, and to see the outcome. You can transform lives. You can pray. You can give. And that is something that is amazing. Bartimaeus' life was changed completely because he met Jesus. And it's my prayer that children like Ange will be changed because of my visit today to Dreminus and me reminding you that the poor are our responsibility, that it's our job to look after those living in extreme poverty and to come alongside local churches in the developing world and say, We'll be your support. We'll be your strength. We'll help you make a difference. This is a little video. It's of a guy called Richmond. He lives in Uganda, as it happens. He's been a sponsored child, and he's now a pastor. And this is the difference sponsorship made in his life. So let's have the video. My name is Rich Monroe I come from a country called Uganda. My mother was a uh, very loving mother. My father was a uh, very hard worker. But unfortunately, when he was murdered, everything changed for us dramatically. We ended up in a slum called Naguru, which is Uganda's worst slum. Naguru was that beautiful cotton community. The life on the street was extremely difficult. The things I did to survive. children of the dignity of choice. I would have chosen school, I would have chosen food, I would have chosen health. When this compassion started to came to our home, I told my mom that Richard was going to sponsor and the amount of guts in the field of home was beyond description. My sponsor began to write to me and I just, I felt known, I felt connected. They basically helped me become a child again. You can make a difference. I thought it'd be good to pray just as we consider what we've heard this morning, to consider how we could help, what we can do. It mightn't be for everyone, I recognize that. I spoke with a 75-year-old lady this week and she said to me, I wish I'd done this 20 years ago. I said, the most important thing is you're doing it now and that's amazing pastor said to me that children leave the project with more hope, better parenting skills, and a commitment to raising a family. We have noticed lower domestic violence and abuse from our children who graduate, more self-confidence, less poverty in their family, 
in more pure and godly living. That's why we do it. That's why we're involved in these areas. Let us pray. Father, we can see Bartimaeus' life was totally changed when he met Jesus. Many of us can speak from personal experience and say that our lives have been changed through knowing you, through trusting you, through walking with you. And we give you thanks for Jesus, for Calvary, for the resurrection, for the ascension. Thank you that Jesus is coming again. And whether he meets us in the air or whether he takes us home, we know that we are safe in him because of your grace. Thank you for children like Ange, that we have an opportunity to make a difference. Father, we pray that you will touch our hearts, stir us with compassion to be involved and make a difference. Thank you for your word. Thank you for what Dominus congregation are already doing and challenge others to join you in this great work. We pray in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Thank you, David. We're going to stand and sing once more, uh, facing a task unfinished.
grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all forevermore. Amen. Thank you.